Hi guys, welcome to this uh, second session of time series for uh, Quant's CFL level 2. This is also the last session for time series and also the last session for regression as a whole from the Quant. So if you are starting to get frustrated, then when is this regression going to end? Well, this is it. And we're still not done with Quant's. We still have three more readings left, but those are purely theoretical readings, very small. So we still have those to cover in quants, but today would be the end for the regression part of quants. So let's get right into the next topic, which is random walk. Now, before we discuss what random walk is, there is one topic that we left that I marked that I would cover at a later time. Let's, let's cover that. We had something known as mean reversion level. If you remember from the AR model, an AR model is usable only when it is covariance stationary and one of the condition of proving covariance stationarity was that there has to be a constant and finite expected value which is known as the mean reversion level or the mean reversion value. What exactly does this mean? Well, this is a specific assumption where we believe that every series has a mean level. So let's just label it as mean. And this is time. So because we are dealing with AR model, we only have one series and we look at it in context of time. Now mean reversion level says that in reality, what should happen? Now, again, this is an assumption. So be prepared for uh, some you know, real world data that might not follow it. But what this is saying is, if my actual value of x is higher than mean, over time it would try to correct back to the mean value. So basically, if my actual value is higher than mean, it would fall back, it would try to correct to the mean value. Similarly, if my actual value is lower than mean, it would try to correct back to mean as well. So basically what it's saying is the entire series will constantly try to correct back and match with the mean value. If it goes higher, it would try to fall. If it goes low, it would try to increase again. Basically, I have a mean level and my assumption is that this is where the entire series is constantly going to try to revert back to. If it goes high or low, it would reverse and try to fall back to the mean level. Now, if we look at this, one thing that is relevant is that if, now just to clarify, I'll write the equation quickly that we have for AR model, xt is b0 plus b1, xt minus 1 plus error term. Now, error term is something, you know, if we are doing uh, expected value, the value of error term becomes zero. Because when we are predicting, we normally expect the error to be zero. Now, if my previous value was at mean itself, which means, now so far we've looked that if previous value is higher than mean, it would try to fall. If it is lower than mean, it would try to increase. But if it is already at mean. Then my assumption of mean reverting level implies that xt would also stay at mean because it's a mean reversion level. If my previous value was at mean, my prediction is that my next value would also stay at the mean. It won't move up or down, which means x t minus 1 is equal to x t if x t minus 1 was in fact the mean of the series. So once we've established this, now all of this is assuming this part that the previous value was at mean. If I have this equation and the first initial equation, over here just remove the error part or take it as 0. So this part you can remove for now. If I look at both of these series, I am able to conclude one thing. 
that if x t minus 1 and x t are the same thing which is equal to mean I can calculate the mean reverting level as b0 upon 1 minus b1. So basically what you will do is if I take this to be xt because they both are equal. I simply take xt on one side and then I solve it. I will get b0 divided by b minus 1. So basically just you know mathematical equation solving something you must have done in 5th, 6th class, 5th, 6th grade. So using this assumption itself. So assumption was that if the value uh, is higher than mean it would fall back. If it's lower it would increase. If it's at the mean it would stay at the mean. So using this entire assumption set of mean reversion level I found out that my mean reverting level can be calculated using B0 1 minus B1. Remember this formula. This is important for your exam. Now once we have this value if you remember carefully the three conditions for covariance stationarity. The first one was a constant and finite expected value which means this mean reverting value has to be constant and finite which raises one more concern that in this mean reverting level B1 should not be equal to 1. Because if my value of B1 is equal to 1, my mean reverting level would end up being B0 divided by 0. Anything divided by 0 is undefined. So if my B1 ends up being equal to 1, we call this situation as my AR model having a unit root. So if, or rather let's write it in a text form so that it would be easy for you to write. If b1 is equal to 0 which is known as unit root, my covariance stationarity ceases to exist. So my AR model will no longer be covariance stationary. So the one thing that we have as a red flag is I can calculate mean reverting level using this formula. It would almost always work in an AR model. The only case where it would fail to work is when I have a case of unit root where B1 is equal to 0 because the moment B1 equals to 0, I can't have a value of anything divided by 0. That's undefined. It's not a finite value. So in that particular case, we have a problem at our hands and one case that your syllabus is highlighting where we have a unit root that case is known as random walk. So now let's look at what random walk is. Now that we've looked at the mean reverting level let's look at what exactly random walk is. Now random walk is basically a concept which says that my value of x at time t is best explained by the actual value one time period before. So basically what I am saying is my value of x is explained by my value of x one time period before and any change between these two is purely random. So basically the best estimate for any value of x at time t is the value of x one time period before and something entirely random, some unexplained error portion. So that's the reason why we call it a random walk. It is basically saying that any change that happens in the distribution x, it is not explained outright by anything. Rather, that change is purely error term. So basically, if error was actually 0, my series would remain same. xt, xt minus 1, all the values would end up being same. But in reality with random walk, what we have is, this is simply saying, whatever I wish to tell, let's say 
x is price of a share. So, price of a share, let's say price of apple. Price of apple share today is best explained by price of apple share yesterday plus some random change that has happened which would cause the share price to go either up or down. So, this is what we have as a random walk. Now, if you look closely, our standard equation for an AR model is this. If you compare these two, I can say that random walk is a specific type of AR model where B0 is equal to 0 and B1 is equal to 1. So, if my AR model satisfies these two criteria, it automatically turns into a random walk. So, let us write it into text. If AR model satisfies this condition, then my AR is a random walk. Now, there is also another kind of uh, regression or time series that you have, which is known as random walk with drift. Concept wise random walk and random walk with drift are one and the same thing. The only difference is if you look closely over here the condition was that B0 has to be 0. So, the intercept term has to be 0 and the slope coefficient has to be 1. Now, in random walk with drift B0 can be any value. So, basically now what I am saying is random walk can also have an intercept term. So, if my intercept is a non-zero value, then my random walk becomes a random walk with drift. My slope coefficient would still have to be 1. So, both random walk and random walk with drift, because the b1 is equal to 0, they exhibit a problem of unit root, which means both of them are not outright covariance stationary. Hence, their regression results are not usable outright. So, I hope the discussion about random walk and random walk with drift, this all part makes sense. Now, once we know that yes, we have a random walk, there are two further concepts that we need to cover. One is how exactly do we test for unit root? We can't always, you know, have an equation or have something given to us where we can just look and tell that yes, B1 is 1. At times, a value of B1 equal to 1, just like we've been testing everything else, we might want to construct a confidence interval around it because we know that at B1 is equal to 1, we can't use the regression. It's not covariance stationary. What if the value of B1 was 0 0.99999? In that case, we will have a constant and finite expected value. We will have a mean reversion level, but that is not statistically different from the situation that we already have when b is equal to 1. So, in those situations, just like we've done in entire stats, we might want to conduct some sort of a testing where we decide whether the value is significantly different from 1 or not. So, I'm not just saying that it has to be exact equal to 1. I also want to construct a sort of range where I would say that if the actual value of B1 falls within this range, I'll conclude that yes, it's still a case of it being a unit root and it's not really usable for me. So, the regression won't be useful. So, we have that testing method and then we also have to cover a small topic about how exactly do we correct when we have a unit root. So, let's look at those two parts. Now, the one method that your syllabus is focusing on to test whether a distribution has a problem with unit root or not. And, you know, whenever it has a problem with unit root, we will get the same situation. It's no longer usable because of the violation of the covariance stationary conditions. So, the sort of method that we have is the Dickey-Fuller test.
Now, just like T test or chi square test, the good thing for your syllabus is the institute is not really concerned with you being able to perform the entire test for the exam. Just knowing why this test is usable, how you know it sort of solves our problem, that is about as much as you are expected to know for your syllabus. So let's look at exactly what the problem is. So if I have this as my equation. The problem with unit root is, I was often running into the issue that v1 is equal to 1. Now what this Dickey Fuller test did is, it simply subtracted x t minus 1 from both sides of the equation. Now if you know I rearrange a few things, I have x t minus x t minus 1 is equal to b0 plus b1 minus 1 now one of the problem we were having with the initial equation is that when we look at our regression you know excel the all the regression that we've done in excel it was always giving me t stat and all the values so that I could check whether this value of b1 was equal to 0. So our regression was always customized around the fact that I would want to check as my null hypothesis whether this b1 was equal to 0. If I wanted to check b1 equal to 1, this is basically what I want to check whether my uh, slope coefficient has a unit root. When I wanted to check b1 is equal to 1, the problem I was running into is the computer softwares and you know all the models. They are not exactly designed for this. They are designed to check whether it is significant or not. They are not designed to check whether it has a unit root or not. So basically what they have done in Dickey Fuller test is they have modified the regression itself. So basically this is what we have as you know something we are able to analyze using the calculations that we've already done so far and this was not outright possible with those same set of calculations. What we have in DF test is they modified the equation in such a form that now if I run this entire equation what I'll get is now my regression result I can check whether b1 minus 1 is equal to 0. If you notice carefully what I've done is I have changed my slope coefficient from just being b1 to being b1 minus 1. Basically what they did in their actual testing is they gave it another name g which is b1 minus 1. So basically they renamed this entire slope coefficient and gave it another name and then they tested whether g is statistically significant or not. If g is insignificant. I would automatically prove that b1 is equal to 1. So basically, you know, just maths are easy. If I am testing this as my null hypothesis, it is same thing as saying my null hypothesis is b1 equal to 0. So all I've done now is my regression calculations in their natural format, they are capable of analyzing whether the slope coefficient is statistically significant or not. They were not capable of analyzing whether b1 takes a specific value. So I cannot check using those whether b1 is equal to 2, whether it's equal to 3 or any of those things. Now what I have is I have modified the equation using the Dickey Fuller test so that now I have a slope coefficient which when I check the slope coefficient against 0 it automatically checks whether I have a problem of unit root or not. So uh, I'm sorry, this would be b1 is equal to 1, not 0, not 0. So basically, if I solve this, I am inadvertently checking whether my null hypothesis is that do I have a problem of unit root or not. So all they've done is just modify the equation so that now when I use my regression calculations, it automatically is checking whether I have unit root 
or not. So this is my test to find out whether I have a problem of unit root and whether there is a violation of the condition of covariance stationarity. So once we have the detection done, next part is how exactly do we correct for it. Now just before we go to next part, once we are done till there, the rest of the process in case you are curious it's not you know going to be specifically tested practically in the exam like it hasn't really been focused in terms of questions but even if you are curious as to what is to be done once we have this after that the process is same as linear regression so we've tested b1 equal to 0 in linear regression using t stat p value all of those things we do the same thing here so all we've done is we've simply re-modified our equation so that now our null hypothesis will be testing unit root rather than zero. So let's move on to the correction part. So once we have used the Dickey Fuller test to detect whether we have a problem of unit root or not, the next method is correcting it. So the correcting is done using a method known as first difference. So just to give an idea as to what first differencing is, normally we have a distribution x, t, so we have multiple values for this distribution and we run a regression on x, t and a lagged version of the x, t itself. So x, t becomes the dependent variable and we can have a lagged version x, t minus 1, t minus 2, anything, t minus 10 as an independent variable. Now, when we have that particular equation and we've observed that it has a unit root problem, the correction is, let's say xt and xt minus 1. These were the two series that I was using for my regression. The first differencing method says that we should try to create a third series which is based on difference of these two. So basically what I'm doing is, I am creating a new variable which is basically difference of my previous variable. So y t represents x t minus x t minus 1. Similarly, y t minus 1 would represent x t minus 1 minus x t minus 2. So basically, one time lag worth of difference between the x series is what I have as my y series. I am just creating a different series altogether. Now I will have a new equation which would be something like this. So basically what I've done is instead of running regression on my initial series, I will now try to run regression on the difference of my initial series. So I have modified both left hand side and the right hand side in order to incorporate the differences. So I am no longer analyzing the series itself, I am analyzing the difference between the two series. Now, yt represents xt minus xt minus 1. If you remember from random walk, random walk said that xt is xt minus 1 plus error term. If I just rearrange these terms, I can say x t minus x t minus 1. The difference between the x is something entirely random, it's an error term. So basically what I've concluded is y t is same as the error term. Now if I use this particular result and combine it with my modified equation, I have a situation where error is equal to b0 plus b1 y t minus 1 plus error. Now for this third equation to hold true, both of these values should be equal to 0. Otherwise, I won't have left hand side equal to right hand side. So basically what we have is P0 should be equal to B1, which is 0. Now the reason why Y cannot be 0, well, entire Y series is just error terms. If my error term becomes 0, then this, these two series are basically the same, which means I'm running an analysis on a series of just zeros. 
So that is not going to be the case because if you are running an analysis on an entire series where every data set is equal to zero, it's a null series. It's not going to give any result at all. So we don't take that particular case. The reason why this is the only case possible, if you remember, in case of random walk, B0 was zero. So this is our new outcome that we have where we have corrected our initial series into a different format so that now it has both slope coefficient and intercept term as zero. Now, if I solve the mean reversion form, the mean reversion was B0 upon one minus B1. This would be zero. Though the value is zero, it is now finite and constant. So now my series has a finite and constant mean reversion level. Now, if you look carefully, this mean reversion level is not of the initial series, but this is for the series of Y. And the series of Y was a series of error terms. So what I'm saying now is, I've created a new series, third series. This series, which contains just random error terms, its expected value is zero. Now, if you look carefully, if you remember all the way back to linear regression, one of the main assumptions we had both in linear and multiple regression is the expected value of error term is equal to zero. So this thing is nothing but a reiteration of the same. It's saying that if I just had a series of error terms at different time periods, the mean reversion level or the mean level for that series would be zero. So all they have done in the first differencing is they've tried to recorrect my equation in such a form that now I'm using that assumption that the error term is equal to zero. I'm trying to use that assumption to try to make some sense out of my random walk equations. So I hope all of that made sense. Again, first differencing, knowing the method is important and how exactly did it correct for it, that's important. Getting practical calculations with entire linear regression, multiple regression stuff that we've already done, that is very rare and you don't need, really have too many questions focusing on that. In fact, most of the questions are just focusing on knowing what first differencing is and knowing when exactly do we use this to correct. So we use it to correct for unit root and how it does it is it gives us a finite mean reversion level. So the problem with uh, unit root is we don't have a finite mean reversion level. This first differencing tries to correct that using the main assumption that we had that expected value of error term is zero. So I hope all of this makes sense. Let's move on to the next topic. The next topic that we have is autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity. Now I know that is a very long name. So we summarized it all. You know, we have a short form as ARCH. Now, just as technical and difficult as this concept might seem when you look at the name, the actual concept is as easy. So it is a very basic, very small concept. Basically, I'm looking at conditional heteroscedasticity within my AR models. Now, if you remember, conditional heteroscedasticity was a situation where my variance of error terms was starting to get linked by the level of independent variables. As the independent uh, variables increased, the variance in my error term also increased. So the variance of error term was somewhat being explained by my independent variables, whereas we wanted the variance of error terms to be constant based on our assumptions. So this is not exactly that, it's a slight modification. So this arch is a condition when variance of one error term is being explained by variance of another error term with a lagged version. So I am looking at something like this, T minus 
key. Now this key can be anything. It could be one, two, three, four, five, anything. So basically, what I'm saying now is one time periods error, the variance of errors. It is trying to explain, or rather, it is linked with the variance of errors in another time period. So if you look at serial correlation, we were talking about error terms themselves having correlation. This is talking about the variance having some sort of relation with a variance of another time period. So serial correlation is talking about the error terms themselves. Arch is talking about the variance of error terms. Now variance of error terms is just a square. Now the best way to check whether my series, my error model has this issue or not is to run a regression on the variance itself so that we have a0 plus a1 plus you know error term i'm going to denote it with a small e just so that you don't get confused what we'll basically do is once we have the error terms from the initial regression we can create both of these so we have error t series we have error t minus k series and we calculate the variance using squares sum of squares of error terms is basically my variance so i have both the variance with me i simply run a regression on those two now in this regression this is my key focus if a1 is statistically significant now let's you know go all the way back to linear regression we had uh, y is equal to b0 plus b1 x plus error term now if we were checking b1 and b1 came out to be statistically significant it meant that x is statistically relevant for explaining the movement in y x is a relevant factor to explain the movement of y similarly if a1 comes out to be statistically significant now how do we check again t stat p value the same thing we've done if a1 comes out to be statistically significant it would mean that variance of a time now i've taken t minus one it could be any other value the variance of a time period which is a lagged version is explaining the variance of my current error terms so again i am just using the concept we had for linear regression only thing is now instead of independent and uh, sorry independent and dependent variable being x and y i am just using variance of error terms as my dependent and a lagged version of it as my independent variable. So if A1 is statistically significant, my AR model is suffering from conditional heteroscedasticity. If A1 comes out to be more or less close to zero, it's statistically insignificant, then we'll simply conclude that yes, my AR model doesn't have the problem of conditional heteroscedasticity. So this is the detection part. Now, the good thing for you is when we talk about correction, outright there is no method of correction. Which means, you know, if we prove that A1 is significant and we find out that yes, my model has a problem, I can't actually correct my model in that case. The only thing I can do is that I can use this regression to try to predict the variance in the future. So what I can do now, once I've figured out that, you know, variance is not constant, it is being explained by the previous variances, I don't have a method of correction, rather I have a way in which I can just go around this problem. And that way is, I can try to use this regression to predict the variance of future. If I'm able to predict the variance of future, it makes my future predictions a little bit more reliable so if i'm able to predict that you know what uh, the variance factor in the future is going to increase from 10 percent all the way till 20 percent it would make me better prepared for the future changes that might actually happen so all we can do in case of arch is that if we actually prove that yes arch exists the only sort of 
workaround we have is that we can't correct for it. Might as well use this relation that we ended up finding out. So if we found out this relation, the best approach is we'll use it. So I'll use this relation to try to predict the variance between my regression that could appear in the future. And once I have an estimate for the future variance, I can plan and prepare accordingly. So that's all the discussion we have about autoregressive conditional retroscedasticity. Let's move on to the next topic. The last topic that we have in time series is basically a theoretical topic, which is a culmination of all the different things that we've done so far. So the topic is how do we deal with the situation with the regression that has two time series. So basically what we're talking about here is something like this. So basically what I have is a regression where both dependent and independent variable are separate time series in and of, it, in and of themselves. So my independent variable can be a separate time series. I can have xt, t minus 1, t minus 2, all of that. My y will also be capable of being an independent or a separate time series. So now I have two sets of time series. Now your syllabus is not exactly concerned with you, know, you being able to solve all of this, although solving it is not a rocket science as such. It's very easy. In fact, the examples we've been taking for both linear regression and multiple regression, the ones we did in Excel, the ones that I feel you are now comfortable with, those are basically this. So solving this is something that as far as this class, these sessions go, we've already done them. The Excel files were in fact this itself. So how exactly do we use this? Or rather, when we have two time series, are the regression results actually usable or not? So we have a small table to look at. Let's look at that. So we have yt and xt. And we are checking whether there are covariance stationary. So I can have yes and no and yes and no. So basically we have four possible outcomes. If both of them are covariant stationary, then yes, regression is usable outright. There is no issue. If both of, <coughs> if both of my time series are covariant stationary by themselves, then when I have this regression, I'm able to use them. There is no such problem as there's no problem as such. In case only one of my series is covariant stationary, I would not be able to use the regression. So it doesn't matter whether the independent is covariant stationary or whether dependent is. If only one part of my regression is covariant stationary, in that case, I would not be able to reliably use the results as given by the regression table, the ANOVA table, basically the entire regression analysis. Now the last case is where none of them are covariant stationary. So neither the dependent series is nor the independent series is. In this case, generally, it is a no, but Yes, if the series, so if they are co-integrated. So in reality, you have five cases, one, two, three, four, and then the exception, which is the fifth. Now, the table is fairly easy to understand. The problem you might have is with this word. What exactly does co-integrated mean? In very simple words, co-integrated means the two series are economically linked together. So if there is any economical explanation that we have for these two series that would link them. So we know of some economic logic or some financial logic which links them both. So we took Reliance and Sensex because we know they are part of the same market. They are representing 
Reliance represents a very big sector within the market which is represented by Sensex. So they had some economic link. If they have an economic link, then we call them co-integrated. And that's when we are able to use the regression even if they are not covariant stationary by themselves. This is where most of our cases actually lie. Now, there is also a small discussion in your syllabus of checking whether two series are co-integrated using a statistical approach. So, this is the logical theoretical approach. We also have a statistical approach. Now, calculations are not relevant for your syllabus for this one. In fact, the distribution also is not highlighted. Just need to know one small difference that exists. So, let's look at that. Now, the statistical test that is mentioned in your syllabus, again, only need to know what the test is. Performing it is not relevant. Just knowing the basics, that's relevant. So, let's look at that. The statistical reasoning that is given in your syllabus. It says, if you test a unit root, Now, we test for unit root using the Dickey-Fuller test. So, we are testing for unit root using the DF test. So, basically, you know, we've done the same thing that we did in DF test when we were discussing it. We modified to a form where now my uh, slope coefficient is not B1. It's rather B1 minus 1. And now I'm checking it from my regression whether it is statistically significant or not. Now, normally in DF test, what we do is once we modified the equation, our slope coefficient is now B1 minus 1 instead of just B1. We'll test that slope coefficient using T distribution. For co-integrated, we will use angle and Granger distribution. So normally, we test the Dickey-Fuller test using the t-distribution. But if we use Dickey-Fuller test and compare it with the values as given in Engel and Granger distribution, so EG distribution, this entire thing is known as DFEG test. So if we test it using the EG distribution instead of t-distribution and we still reject the null hypothesis, So, null hypothesis is again same, slope coefficient is equal to 0. If we are still able to reject it, then we consider the two series to be co-integrated. So, that is the statistical check. From my, uh, my suggestion for the exam would be just understanding what the difference is. The only difference is we are checking for unit root using the Dickey Fuller test, that part is common. The only di uh, difference is normally we check against T distribution, this time we are checking against EG distribution. And after checking, if we are able to reject, then we conclude they are co-integrated, that's it. So just knowing this part is relevant for the exam. For your logical understanding, this thing should suffice. So that is our entire discussion about time series. We still have a couple of small topics that we left from multiple regression. Let's look over those. Now, if you look in your curriculum or any other material that you are referring to, after this uh, topic, within time series, another uh, sort of discussion is given. Now, that discussion is almost a sort of a revision of everything that we've done in linear and multiple regression and time series. So, it's just a stepwise process from start to end. So, I would suggest just give it a read. That part I am not covering in these videos specifically. That would be something that, you know, when we cover the summary videos of entire quants. So, there would also be summary videos of entire quants that would be uploaded later on once all the syllabus is done. So, in those summary videos, those readings, which are basically revisionary readings, they automatically will get covered. So, I am not going to be covering them separately for our session. Now, let's cover those two topics that we left from multiple regression and then we'll end the time series. Now, let's look at the two topics that we left at multiple regression because, you know, they are a little more easier to study once we have discussed the time series. So, the first of those is model specifications.
and also the miss specifications so basically model specification is a sort of a process it involves certain steps now these are not rigid steps you just need to have a logical understanding of why they are what they are so normally what happens is whenever i want to analyze something let's say i want to analyze the stock price of a company uh, let's say a banking stock i want to analyze the stock price of state bank of india sbi now there are several factors that i can take in which logically i believe should be relevant for explaining the price movement of sbi now listing down those several factors so i could have interest rate movements from the central bank which is rbi i can have uh, other competitors uh, such as uh, hdfc bank access bank icic i could look at some of those data i could look at npas the non performing assets i could look at other interest rate movements or the interest rate changes that are happening between competitors and the sbi interest rate for home loans education loans all the other types of loans so there are so many factors that i could incorporate that would affect the sbi's operations and eventually i believe they might end up expect uh, they might end up affecting the price as well now model specification is just you know a logical listing of what all steps would i take so first is i would identify relevant relevant factors secondly i would try to you know start adding one or two factors at a time to try to figure out if those factors by themselves are relevant or not i would start by the biggest factors so that right off the bat i know that my regression has most of the important factors considered in because as you know we've discussed a few times i don't want my regression to have 15 or 20 independent variables rather i want to have four or five independent variables which are precise and which give me a relevant explanation as well so i would start with the biggest factors you know the central bank details all of those now at times what we might observe is that sometimes the relation is not linear now if we, if we are to use a, a regression model we need a relation to be linear between dependent and independent variables sometimes that relation might not be linear in fact we study in a time series we can have a linear trend we can have a log linear trend so if the relation is exponential we might need to correct that using a log natural of either the independent variable or the dependent variable depending on which suits best for my need so we might have those issues then we might end up adding some factors as independent variables which are not actually as relevant so we might have to remove those so this entire process of how i initially think about a model and what all modifications and changes i make to get it to a final stage where finally i use its result to replicate some investment action or some investment analysis in the real world all of this is known as model specification and the miss specifications are various issues we might have in the process so some of the common miss specifications are well omission i just simply forget about some important factor and i don't take it as an independent variable so let's say i'm talking about a banking stock and i end up forgetting about central bank's interest rate policies that is something that would drastically affect my regression because i have omitted i have forgotten to add one of the more relevant independent variables i can also have a transformation issue where the relation was supposed to be log linear exponential but i forgot to correct it so now i am using uh, regression but the assumption of regression is not satisfied so the result that i have from the regression they are no longer reliable they are not something that i might actually be able to replicate in the market in real terms so i have those issues then i have issues with input values so maybe i am trying to analyze you know what would be the return of a stock next 3 months so if i am only analyzing for 3 months taking past data for 15 or 20 years might not be the best step because that would include a lot of uh, data sets where the extremities of the economic cycle are being balanced out so over 20 year period my recession my boom period those are being flattened out because i get a sort of an average out return whereas if i am predicting just the next 3 months of return i might want to factor in whether my economy right now is in a recession or in a boom so i might need data specific to some situation in uh, economic sense 
that I have for those three months. So all of those factors are important. One other thing in terms of misspecification we can have is if we used a lagged version of the dependent variable as an independent variable, you know, something we've done in time series as the AR model. One of the things about AR model is we cannot use our traditional serial correlation and heteroscedasticity test and correction methods in AR model. If you remember carefully, AR model has its own steps of detection and correction. So having an AR model, but not following the steps for serial correlation and heteroscedasticity, which are, which are different for AR model, that would also be a misspecification. So we have all of these cases where our model specification might get wrong and once the model is specified wrong the results are you'll get them numerically but they are not actually something you can use reliably in the real world so that is all the discussion about model specifications the last sort of topic we left was about qualitative dependent variable Now, we had a discussion about dependent variables uh, or other qualitative variables by way of dummy variables where, you know, we introduced variables that could take binary values of 0 or 1. We could extend that further to incorporate some information such as ranks. Now, ranks may not always be binary 0 and 1, but ranks are still more or less qualitative because I cannot perform statistical operations on them. So, if I have ranks, I have 40 students, I give them ranks from 1 to 40. I cannot calculate mean, median or mode there. I, I'll get some value 20, 25. Those values are not statistically usable. I cannot use anything. I cannot say the average rank of the class is 20. Like that doesn't make sense. It's not a sensible piece of conclusion that I have drawn. So we can have a situation where why. So dependent variable was why in our regression analysis. Where why itself is qualitative. Now one of the most common use cases of this is in terms of credit reporting, credit rating, loan scores, all of those. So credit scores, credit ratings, all of those are sort of qualitative dependent variables. So we have three different models which are highlighted in your syllabus. Just knowing what those models are in one line, that's enough for your syllabus. Calculations are not there. It's a very small theory topic. So we have probit and logit models where basically you know I'm what I'm doing is I'm trying to stick with my regression I'm not trying to change too many things I'm trying to keep most of the assumptions about linear regression intact so probit model is basically using the same regression we've studied so probit model is basically using all the assumptions of regression that we had it's simply trying to you know incorporate some changes in y or some changes in the equation such that I am able to use my existing regression as it is. Logit models on the other hand, they change just one assumption which is residuals which were basically my error terms. They have logarithmic distribution. So if my error terms have logarithmic distribution, if you remember, one of the assumptions was error terms are normally distributed. If I change that assumption, I'm incorporating some differences from my regression. Now, what those differences are, that's a matter of statistical study, not provided in your curriculum, not relevant for the exams. Another sort of model that we have, the third kind, is discriminant. This is a lot more flex, uh, flexible and a lot more nuanced in the sense that within probit and logit, we were mostly following all the assumptions of regression. Discriminant is allowing us to have different set of assumptions for independent variables. So it is now bringing a drastic change where I can have anything as an independent variable. I can have ratios as independent variable and what I can do is I can specify different set of assumptions for the independent variable for my model. So what's happening is I'm not tied or bound by the assumptions of regression. Rather, I can have a customized independent variable and I can specify assumptions specific to that. So three kinds of model, probit, logit and discriminant. So again, one of the most common uses is 
we use them for credit ratings, credit scores, or uh, loan eligibility scores, all of those. So these are the topics that uh, we left from multiple regression. They are slightly more easy to understand and to cover once we've done time series. So with that, we are finally done with our entire content of regression from the quants. We still have three small theory topics left, machine learning, big data, and scenario simulations. So we look at them in separate classes. For now, the regression content is done. So that's it for this session. If you have any doubts or queries, you can always contact me. I leave my contact details in the description. And as always, I hope you enjoyed it, had fun, found it informative. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.